Good evening and a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining our December London Southeast Investor Webinar. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Donald Leggett, Head of Investor Relations, and Phil Thomas and the team would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us online this evening. Tonight, we have four interesting AIM listed companies presenting. Those are Power Metal Resources and Coda Gold, both miners, oil explorer Zephyr Energy, and the virtual reality business VR Education. Our usual format allows for an 18 minute presentation followed by 10 minutes of questions to the speakers from you, the live audience. Just look for the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, type and submit your questions, and I'll put as many as we have time for to each CEO. Please do add your real name so I can give you a name check and apologies in advance if we don't ask you a question. Please don't take it personally. We'll send you a copy of the slide pack for each company tomorrow morning. And as you know, each company has their own webpage on the lac.co.uk website. So you can get up to speed on the company there with all the company fundamentals and so on and leave a message on the company chat board while you're at it. Most companies keep at least half an eye on their board, so it most certainly isn't time wasted. Okay, Power Metal Resources. Our first company tonight is Power Metal Resources, an AIM-listed metals exploration and development company seeking a large-scale metal discovery. The CEO is Paul Johnson. Welcome, Paul. And I believe Power has nine assets in development, and those include gold exploration in both America and Australia, as well as base metal exploration in Africa. POW's market cap as of today is 19 million pounds. And here we are. Over to you, Paul Johnson. Thank you very much, Donald. I now have to uh, do the magical techie stuff of turning on the screen, which is an achievement for me, I can assure you. And it's all looking good at this end. Marvellous. There you go. Oh, bingo, bango. Right, CEO. So good evening, everybody. Uh, normally in these presentations, uh, the management come on and they talk about the company. They want to encourage people to take a look at the stock and research. They want to increase awareness. They want you to buy the shares because that helps. Uh, it helps on a number of different perspectives. One, with share price performance. Also, it helps them to raise money so that they can pay salaries and so on very important for a board. Uh, in my case, I want to take this a different direction. I'd like to talk about the company from a private investor's perspective. Now, I'm not talking about you high net worths out there. I'm not talking about institutional funds out there. You guys have got enough cash. I'm more concerned about the private investors with smaller capital pools who are trying to build that into a larger pool that can change the nature of their life, what they can do with their lives. And I can do that, I think, because in my case in Power Metal, myself and my wife, Michelle, have invested £350,000 cash, real cash, into this business over the last two years. So every single day, not just during this presentation, I have to justify to my family, including my six-year-old, Thomas, why I've put that amount of money, a huge amount of money into this business. And it's not just me, it's the board also, because I hold about 7% of the stock and my board and their connected parties hold another 7%. So in total, we have 14%. So when I'm having board discussions, talking about business strategy and trying to do new things and build the business, I have to justify what I'm doing because they have a large amount of money invested too. So we are here primarily to make money in our space. There's no reason to be here, really, unless you have that as your primary objective. But I think it's nice to see the story actually be engaging and something that you can attach yourself to over a period of time. So again, I'm focused not just on those that want a quick in and out, but I want to focus on those people that like the story and stay and run with us take the risk as it were. Now, from my perspective as a director, if the share price goes up 100% tomorrow, that's fine. It's great to see. But spikes in the share price don't help me to build value for my own family. I need to see those price moves sustained and maintained. 
And that's absolutely key in everything I do that we build a strong business over the short, medium and long term. I don't have any other interests. This is me and everything that I can do in the resource space uh, will go into this company if possible. So there's the disclaimer. Do your own research, folks. Uh, there's lots of information on our website and this presentation, which is available online. There's a message for me personally. This is a personal campaign. It's not just a company. I don't do this for salary. I do this because I think I can turn my capital into a much bigger sum. There's a brief background. Power Metal Resources are focused on precious metals in North America and Australia and base metals in Africa. We have a range of projects, early stage through to later stage drill prospects. There's the board of directors. I won't give them any more glory than I'm sure they deserve. And there's the capital structure. And you can see that 14% that the board holds and 7% personally. OK, so we have nine projects. I can't possibly run through them all today. And it's quite difficult when you have that diversified model to get that message across about every single project in any one presentation. So I mentioned story before, and I'm going to focus on two projects, one Australia and secondly, Botswana Malopo Farms. Tell you a little bit about how they came about, how we did the deals and where they are now and what our aspirations are for the future. Australia Gold. Now, back in March, uh, you, uh, well, quarter one, really, we were approaching difficult circumstances and lockdowns. And we were all, or most of us, sat in uh, at home, working away. I was in the front room. We converted it into an office. And Michelle brought me sandwiches and coffee on a regular basis, for which I'm grateful. And we were distracted from the lockdown situation because we were looking at Australia and Victoria. We've been looking at it for quite some time, uh, probably about a year, and we identified that there were some rich gold uh, properties in Victoria Goldfields area. So in early 2020, we also noticed an increase in activity and interest in the space. Uh, this is Victoria Goldfields properties. And we decided to move ahead quickly, as fast as we could, and start to assemble a portfolio of ground. We did this with Red Rock Resources, who had an available vehicle, Red Rock uh, Australasia PTY Limited, an Australia company, private company. And we started to go about building licensed ground. Well, we started and we couldn't stop because over a number of months, we eventually built up to 13 license applications in Victoria, all of which have evidence of gold mineralization, and many of which are in very strategic positions near former gold mining centers. There's the area on the map in front of you. And you can see that central to one of our main uh, batches of license applications is the Ballarat mine. And you can see the gold production that's coming out of that mine. There's the overall footprint that we've built on the map in front of you and a list of the licenses on the right hand side. Now, we undertook as soon as we had the ground an overall technical review and we had prepared technical reports which are on our website for most of those projects. So if you want to read about most of those projects and the gold uh, prospectivity, you can actually do it. We don't want to hide anything. We're putting all of our information where possible on the website. And you'll see from those reports the amazing prospectivity around. There's the same footprint in slightly different colors, and you can see a little bit more information. This is one of the largest footprints that uh, is available in that area. It has strategic significance. And because of that, we looked around and decided how could we take this forward? And if you look at the different levels of mineralization that you have across different project interests, which we drew from the technical reports, you can see this is something of considerable value. Now, over in Canada, there was a company that came onto the TSX in earlier on this year, uh, and it had a, a effective, uh, it wasn't an IPO, it was an introduction, they didn't raise money, but it had a value of circa 40 cents prior to the introduction to the TSX V. And over the space of a few months, they increased in value to, I think, over $5, a huge increase and hundreds of millions of dollars in value. And we thought there was an 
opportunity here to take some or all of this package and put it onto a North American stock exchange. Now, part of the process of doing that is you have to produce a technical report. So we took eight of the license applications that we put in and we had a National Instrument 43101 report prepared on it. And that is on our website. So again, you could go and see this report and read about this package of licensed ground. Now, there are so many opportunities with this license package and how to take it forward. And we're currently working through all of those elements, including the potential listing, working with potential partners on some of these uh, license applications. We're developing exploration plans. Uh, we've got some quite advanced exploration now and we want to do more. And we're also finding uh, uh, wherever possible new opportunities within the ground through the ongoing technical review. We've established, established an office in Ballarat. We've, established, we've taken on board an exploration manager. We have local experts because with the lockdown difficulties, you needed local people. And we're pushing ahead as far as we can. The main step of value creation going forward will be the grant of licenses, and we're simply awaiting the grants. We've supplied information to the local regulator as required. We've submitted our applications. Now we have to simply wait for the grants to come through, and then we can start cracking with ground exploration and corporately as well. So second area, Botswana. Now, back in uh, mid-18, I personally invested in Kalahari Key Mineral Exploration, which was a private Botswana company which had interest in the Malopo Farms complex project, just the MFC project, nothing else. Over the months that passed by, the company did helicopter airborne electromagnetic work and identified multiple targets across their licensed ground in Botswana perspective for nickel copper PGMs and so on. Now, uh, the company wanted to raise some further money in 2019, and it raised some money, but there was a little bit more needed. And it was such an obvious opportunity that Power Metal Resources stepped in and invested cash into the business. About circa 200,000 pounds. They also bought out at cost my uh, original stake, so there wasn't a conflict. We used that money for ground geophysics. We identified multiple targets. We uh, narrowed those targets down with further work, and we got to four high-profile drill targets. Here's the license area on the map. And there we go in a little bit more detail. Now, those four targets are currently being drilled. 2,500 meters of drilling over four holes. We completed hole one and announced it. We're in the uh, process on hole two, and we've made some announcements in respect of hole two. You'll notice we like to keep the market updated with progress. I know the normal thing in the companies is to just say nothing for a while, possibly because many companies are not doing very much. But in our case, we like to give that information to market and show you exactly where we are. We're targeting large scale district scale potential nickel sulfide PGM targets. This is, if we're fortunate and we find what we're looking for, company transformational stuff. Okay, so on top of the uh, Australia Gold joint venture, on top of the Botswana Nickel PGMs joint venture, we have a project in joint venture with Kavango Resources at the Ditto Camp in Botswana. Also with Kavango Resources, the Kalahari Copper Belt. That same place where a few years ago I found T3 with Metal Tiger and MOD Resources, that big, big copper discovery, and where there's been some great news from Sandfire in the last day. We have a project in Cameroon, Cobalt Nickel, situated near to a major, major uh, uh, cobalt project, the Comuna uh, Cobalt Project. We also have in Canada an interest in a silver project, Silver Peak, generated lots of excitement amongst the investor base. We understand why and we're excited too. We did lots of work on this in the last year. We wanted to do a more extensive drilling program, but the snowfall uh, prevented us from finishing it, but we've got lots of data to work with going forward. There's a few pictures. In the DRC, we have a seven kilometer long copper cobalt anomaly that we're doing work on. At the moment, we want to move into geophysics and eventually drilling some targets. 
And in Tanzania, we have a joint venture with Katoro Gold, uh, where we've announced mobilization of drilling for another large-scale nickel sulfide PGM project. You see, it's hard to squeeze all this in in a short space of time. And in the USA, wrapping things up, we have the Alamo Gold Project, where we can earn into a 75% interest, which is nugget gold near surface and searching for that nugget gold together with the bedrock source and other potential mineralization. So that's the uh, project portfolio of the company. Apologize for the speed and rapidity. As always, if you have any questions you want to ask, my mobile phone number is on all market news announcements. And also you can send them to info at powermetalresources.com. Now I want to concentrate finally uh, on one uh, important area. Now this company, uh, and me personally, do not engage in heavy discounted placings. I know the market is worried about that. And me as a private investor in companies I hold positions in, and I know more widely the uh, investors out there are concerned that company they may buy a share in a company for two pence one day, and then find there's an announcement the next day saying that uh, a placing has been done at 1.25 pence. Absolutely no, that's not how we do business. But we're building our financial investments alongside our operational activities to build our balance sheet. And we're doing that because we want to seek financial self-sustainability. Uh, Try and say that at six o'clock in the evening. Uh, we want to be able to stand on our own two feet and fund our own operations. We can't do that if we constantly go into the market with a begging bowl. Now, if we become financially self-sustaining, we can fund our own operations. It means we don't need to go for financings, but we can go if we wanted to in the future, but they would be on our terms, proper, proper terms for our business. Now, we're going to build our financial sustainability through a number of different ways. You may have noticed on our market news announcements, there's been a feed of warrant money coming into our company. And that, for me as a CEO, is a fabulous thing to see. And it's coming in smoothly, which is exactly what we want. Because as we spend money, that warrant money coming in replaces our expenditure, cancels it out almost, so our working capital position stays reasonably consistent, which is exactly what we want. And in addition to that, we're working hard to build the value of our financial investments so that we have a pool of money that we can tap into when we need to. Now you see on the screen various investments that we have. We're also looking at vending out or spinning out, call it what you wish, some or, or all of individual project interests. And some of which we've talked about publicly, including Australia Gold. Uh, and we've also talked about the Kavango Resources joint venture, which is looking to move into a listed vehicle also. And there are other potential areas because in theory, everything is available if the right situation comes around for a vend out, spin out type situation. Now, when we do that and we get cash or equity in the acquiring company, that goes onto our balance sheet and that money can be released when required to fund our operations. So this is not the mainstay of the business, but it's an important element that enables me to fulfill the business model for our shareholders. So there's the reasons why invest in power metal resources. I would read them off the screen, but it's very simple. In power, you have a board that has 14% of the equity. You have a CEO whose family has put £350,000 into the company. We work consistently uh, on this business. It is a full-time job and then some. We don't drag out huge amounts of money from the business to pay for expensive salaries and fees. We don't drag out huge amounts of money to pay for uh, personal uh, expenses to put me in a fancy seat to fly halfway around the world. Not that you could do much of that at the moment, but we wouldn't do it anyway. You pay for me to take this money, invest it in the ground, find something of value that transforms the share price of the company and gives you as the private investor an opportunity to transform your portfolio and do a few things different with your life that perhaps without this investment, you may not have been able to do. There we go. There's the contact details. We are uh, an open company. We don't hide behind PR agencies. We don't have PR agencies. If you want to speak to us, speak to us. I'm a chartered accountant, a forensic accountant, 
I don't, uh, I'm not a geologist. If it's a technical inquiry, I can get that over to the people who can answer it for you. But generally about this business, and remember, we are a commercial business. We are not here to be a geological university department. We're not here to take your hard-earned money that you invest into the company and blow it on salaries and our own personal benefits. I feel sometimes with companies, I might as well send the directors the money to their savings account directly rather than invest in the shares and go through all the pain. We are here to try and find something big. We may not find something big. Exploration is high risk. We're in the midst of a number of programs at the moment. And I can assure you of one thing. You will, well, two things. You will be kept up to date through Newsflow. And that every morning when I wake up, I wonder, just like you do, is this the day when the big discovery will come through the door? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Paul Johnson. That was uh, as exuberant. How many minutes was that, Donald? Uh, that was, yeah, you were over by about one minute, but I let you off for that. Oh. You're a nice guy. <laughs> Um, let me let me let me put you under the cosh. We've got the, qu the questions okay. are flooding, and the questions are flooding in. Um, well, my my question first. Okay, you talked about the first okay. license to be granted to, in the Australian state of Victoria. You said you haven't got those licenses yet. So, what sort of time frame are you looking for those licenses? Okay, so <clears throat> there's a process in Victoria. Uh, when you submit the license applications, you have to put in exploration plans and so on, and you have to. Uh, put in uh, lots of information with it. Uh, that gets reviewed and then uh, you get uh, highest ranking status, which we've now had on 10 of the 13 applications. I should say only uh, one of those applications, number 13, lucky for some, is, uh, com is in a competitive situation with other parties. The other 12, it's just us. But for the 10 of those 12, we've had highest ranking status and permission to advertise. So uh, we've advertised all 10. Uh, there's a period when uh, you can get uh, feedback, uh, as it were, where people can write in and raise any objections. The department looks at this, and then when they've gone through that process, if they're happy with everything, they will issue granted licenses. So we're just waiting. I, I don't know when it's coming in. Uh, I don't know how long it will take. COVID-19 restrictions and disruptions, together with the fact that Victoria has been deluged with applications and variations, means that they're under a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. So we, we, you know, we push reasonably as a commercial organisation would do, but we have to let them do the job. You know, honestly, it, <laughs> it could be tomorrow, it could be three weeks, it could be three months. I don't know, but what as soon as it comes in. As soon as it comes in. Paul, what's your expectation? Do you expect to actually get most of these licenses? Uh, I'm, we wouldn't have applied for them if we didn't expect to get uh, most of the licenses. You know, we expect to get all of the licenses. We, in some cases, you have to justify that. And in the like, case of license 13 only, license application 13, then we're up against other organisations. Uh, but uh, we just focus on doing the right thing. Uh, I don't know any organisation uh, that would undertake technical reports on almost all of the project uh, applications, would uh, have a 43-101 repair uh, prepared uh, for uh, eight of the applications, would set up the office, employ exploration manager, employ local teams uh, or team members to help with all sorts of different elements. We're gearing up like a professional organization to do this job properly. And I think that stands us in very good stead to get uh, as many of the applications through to grant status as possible. And a Canadian TSX listing, Paul, um, what, what, would, what, what does that depend on? And when might that happen? Okay, well, it depends on various different factors. Uh, it is uh, one of the options available to us. We've been very clear in our announcements that we keep talking about it, so that should give people an indication as to how serious we are. <laughs> we also have to deal with uh, external inquiries into the business about the project uh, in Australia and what, you know, what uh, there are various alternatives and options available to us. There's everybody knows that understands Victoria goldfields. There is a huge amount of interest in the area.
Now, our central focus is we have to get license grants, get on the ground, do exploration, because there's so much evidence of gold mineralization. We think there's going to be some fabulous uh, outcome to exploration work, so we want to crack on. Having said that, there is the commercial side and the uh, potential listing is one very major area. You look at Fosterville South on the TSXV, Nubian Resources on the TSXV and other companies that have generated considerable uplifts in share price from being involved in Victoria. And you think, yeah, that has to be a mainstay of potential options available to the business. But there are many and varied routes that we can go down. Okay, very good. A more broad and general question from a gentleman called Paul Taylor. If you find a couple of big deposits, you're certainly trying hard enough. What's the strategy to add value? Uh, source digging yourself with the joint venture or sell on to surrounding interesting, inter interested parties or sell to a major? Uh, now, that's a good question. Yeah, it all depends on what you find, how you find it, uh, what position you're in as a business. Uh, if you take the situation, sorry to drag that old chestnut in, great than gold, but you know, I, yeah, I have to take some of the glory because we refinanced and restructured that business uh, at Metal Tiger in back in 2016, the 0.1 pence a share, and now it's trading well into the 20s. A huge success story. A lot of that success came about because they brought new crest in. And the key with bringing in a partner, which would be one of our potential mainstay routes to take a project forward. But the key to bringing in a partner is that in the case of Javier on and GGP, Newcrest were clearly switched on to getting on with the job, drilling ASAP and really doing the work fast. So I think if you're thinking of earning, you have to find the right partner. You have to get them to engage immediately and get on with the work. I think the point you is made with your own potential. The point you made to me previously was not essentially you were saying that not every major is the right partner, even though there may be a major, because sometimes you're not the, your, your interests are not material to them. No, because you become a bit part in their story. So you want to find the right partner to come in for the right for the individual project. If someone really needs nickel pipeline and they're, you know, they're, they're willing to pull up a deal that says that they will, you know, pay a, a good amount up front in the first year to get on with drilling, then that's what you want because that's news flow to the market, which is hugely important. But also sometimes you can carry on a bit more and do a bit more work yourself because you find something, you do a few more holes, you seriously increase the value of it. Now, traditionally, uh, big firms have done the earning type situations. They haven't done the buyout of, you know, exploration projects. Usually it's something more established, like a mine uh, that's producing uh, that they will go and buy out. But you never know. The M&A world in our space is starting to hot up a little bit. So disposals might be an option, but we won't know until we find something. So we will switch on to this. We're, we're pretty good at generating value and understanding the options available to us. If we wanted to get in touch with majors, if we find something big, well, we probably wouldn't have to because they monitor all the big projects. But if we wanted to get in touch, we have the routes to do that. And we have all other uh, potential strategies that we could use as well. Good man, that's a lovely answer. Paul, I'm going to stop you there. Uh, a lovely question from Ian McNeil. Given your fairly modest cash resources, how are you going to fund all this exploration development work? Slightly cheeky question, but you know, fair play to Ian. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, in my in my uh, eight years of uh, being involved in running public companies, I've never been in a situation, I think, where we had last reported, was it around 1.7 million of working capital to deploy with cash coming into the business on a regular basis from warrant conversions. I, I don't feel that we're in a, in a small working capital position. We, uh, on an, almost all of our programs, we are not uh, forced down the barrel of a gun to spend. We, we have almost entirely, not entirely, but almost entirely in our uh, contracts and agreements with third parties where we've done transactional work, we, we, we can stop if we want to. We only spend if we are comfortable with it. We have a very significant working capital position at the moment uh, versus our committed spend. We don't have vast central overheads, so that's quite good as well because we're not throwing cash out the door every five minutes on you know board salaries and that kind of thing. Uh, so overall, we, I feel in control. You know, I, I'm a, an accountant, uh, risk management focused accountant, so I really worry about money and I really worry about you know, how much money do we have. I, I, I've never felt quite uh, as comfortable as I do now, not because I'm stupid, but I know that the way we've structured this business is protective of investors. And I do that, I suppose, because for selfish reasons, because I have 70% of the stock. 
Okay, well, we have time for one last question. I'm going to squeeze, if you could answer this one quickly. I'm going to take you, you mentioned Australia as being prominent, and the second prominent asset was the Botswana Malopa Farms Complex. You're drilling there at the moment. What's the latest on the drill? Are you, are you happy with progress? The latest on the, the drill we provided very recently via market updates, and I, I couldn't say any more about you know what might have happened since and so on. But uh, we, yeah, we're happy with the progress. This, the, the, these are deep holes into new targets that haven't been drilled in this way before. We're finding out all sorts of things as we go. It's hugely interesting. It's thrilling, actually, uh, which I've said before, because th this is an, uh, an amazing story to take this project all the way through. And, you know, of course, I want to see a discovery. I want to see a district scale opportunity out of Malopo Farms. Uh, but each day we take it one day at a time. We're involved in the operations. We're close to the story. We're, you know, we're thrilled and excited by the opportunity. And I trust that this delivers for our shareholders. Paul Johnson, I'm going to stop you there. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, a great person to, uh, to kick us off uh, for the evening. Thank you for joining us, Paul. Thanks, Donald. Thanks, everyone. And our next guest is Coda Gold. Hey, Donald, how are you doing? Bert Monroe from Coda Gold. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're, doing, we're off to a good start, and uh, I, I'm here. I know you've, you've just put out news, so it, it doesn't get much better than that. Let me just do a brief introduction for you. Coda Gold is an aim-listed gold company focused on two well-established gold regions, Mali and its next door, next door neighbor, Senegal in West Africa. Coda's primary focus has been on further developing the highly prospective Sanon Coda gold discovery in southern Mali. That was until yesterday, of course, when they announced a new drilling program near Hummingbird's Yanfalula gold mine. Coda have signed a $21 million term sheet to fully fund the development of Sanon Coda, and that's dependent on completing a definitive feasibility study by the end of 2021. Bert Monroe is here with us tonight. He's the CEO. Welcome, Bert. Very well done on all the pronunciations, Donald. Uh, good to hear you <laughs> saying it so well. Thank you. And uh, thanks, everyone, for, for listening in this evening and, and being here. Uh, it's great to be able to present to you all. Um, really exciting time for Cora, as Donald said. Uh, I actually just got back from Mali this weekend. I was there for the last week. So it's been great to get out to site. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been too long, really, and it's been great to see all the team. So, um, let me just share screen. Um, let me know if you can see that all right, Donald. Yes, that's lovely. Thank you. Well done. Perfect. Um, so let me just take you through, obviously, a bit of background to Cora. But just to kick you off, um, obviously, as Donald said, I'm Bertman, I'm the CEO. Uh, I started in January of this year as CEO. I spent the previous 11 years uh, of my career at Hummingbird Resources. Uh, I was with Hummingbird through both being private to public, uh, making the formally announced discovery in Liberia, uh, and through the acquisition and development of Jan Falila into production. So uh, very much West African focus, very much focused taking exploration projects through into production. Um, Cora Gold um, is a fantastic company. It's got a great set of permits. Um, it's got over 1,100 square kilometers of ground in West Africa, predominantly in Mali, but also in Senegal. Uh, we've got our primary project, San Ancoro, uh, significant gold discovery, which I'll talk a lot more about later, but. Uh, it's got lots of nice deep oxide material, which is uh, free digging with, with high recoveries, which should make mining amenable and, and cost effective. Uh, we've got a, a great team, which has been together far longer than I have been at the company. They've, they've been together as a team making discoveries in West Africa for a number of decades now. Um, and the scoping study itself has got you know, a very high return, uh, high IRR, 107% IRR at a $1,500 gold price. So we feel we're, we're well set and in a great place. Uh, our cash position is $5 million uh, in the bank as we stand, so extremely well financed to deliver uh, a very large drill program, which has just been commencing over the last few weeks. Uh, and obviously, come the end of next year, assuming we, we deliver what we plan to do, uh, a positive feasibility study, we have the funding lined up based on our scoping study economics. So I think it's worth talking about that a little bit. It's, it's pretty rare for a junior at our stage um, to have essentially a fully financed solution in place this early uh, with a very strong partner. Um, Lionhead is, is, is a family office investment fund. Uh, it's, it's linked to the Quirk family, our largest shareholder. The Quirks are a, a multi-generational um, African mining family. Um, they were the largest shareholders in Lionel, which sold out for over $6 billion to, to Norilsk uh, and obviously been involved in a number of other successful ventures. So I think there are lots of juniors out there with 
with good assets and exciting projects. But I think um, finding juniors who, who have those good assets as well as um, funding and the shareholders in place already is, is obviously an exciting position to be in. And I'm very fortunate and very lucky to have been asked to take over as CEO to, to drive forward the next page. So our strategy very simply is, to, is to try and deliver San Ancoro into production as quickly uh, as possible fundamentally. Uh, San Ancoro, we believe, is, is a straightforward project. Uh, as I mentioned, it's got a nice deep um, oxide profile. It's, it's up to 100 meters of oxide depth, so free digging material. Uh, we believe it will lend itself to a, a very straightforward processing route with, with high recoveries, uh, low strip ratio, uh, which should lead us to, to high margin gold production uh, and also importantly, hopefully low capital cost uh, to build it. Additionally, as a secondary strategy, we, we've got a large land package in amongst um, some big mines and big operating mines. So, so we also carry out um, continuous ongoing regional exploration in the hope of making a big discovery, which could be transformational. Uh, listening to our last presentation, we heard Paul talking about the value of making a discovery. So I think it's important for us to, to not only concentrate on delivering San and Coro, uh, which is our bread and butter, but I think leaving that optionality, leaving that option value of, of going out there and, and drilling holes in, in new permits, in new areas, uh, particularly near to mines in, in prolific gold belts, uh, gives us the opportunity to, you know, to make significant advances in that side as well. A little bit on the team, I think, uh, importantly on this slide, uh, I would just highlight Norm Bailey. Uh, I just brought him in as our head of exploration to replace uh, John Forster, who was the outgoing CEO before me and then head of exploration as well. Uh, Norm's been involved in over 30 million ounces of discovery and development in West Africa in the last 30 years. I mean, that is um, a massive achievement. Uh, he was involved with Redback um, through Toronto and Taziast, uh, 20 million ounces there. Uh, and more recently, he's been... You know, working in Sudan, and he's been with he's been with Sudan. Oh, sorry, he's been with Sentiment uh, for the last three years. So, Norm is is a great asset. Uh, he's a great hire. I've just been with him in Mali the last week. He flew out and is and is spending two months straight uh, on the ground, uh, driving the drill rig and really getting on top of all the programs. So, uh, it's great to have him on board, uh, and obviously supported by you know many other experienced guys. Siaka Kimara, country directors been with the company since its inception in 2012. Um, he worked with the previous management team, John Forster and Craig Banfield uh, in their previous companies as well. He speaks four languages, was, was trained in Russia um, and is a Malian national. So a great guy to have as our country manager um, in country. This is a, an overview of our land package. Uh, on the left-hand side of your page, you can see the Kenny Aber window, West Mali projects. You've got four permits there down the Mali, Senegal border. This arguably is the most prolific gold belt um, in West Africa or even in Africa at the moment. Um, you can see you know, the likes of Sadiola very close to our permits. You obviously go down the Mako mine, obviously bought, from, um, by, bought by Resolute off Toro Gold recently. So we are, in terms of postcode, uh, we're in a great postcode. Um, we started drilling Medina Full Bay earlier this year. Unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, that, was, that was paused, that drilling program. We're hoping to start drilling again relatively soon we, we opened up the field camp again uh, very recently and uh, doing further field work on the right hand side of your page um, this is our i guess our main focus in the middle of the permits block there you can see the san and coro block of permits it's made up of four per of five permits sorry um, including san and coro is one of them um, obviously directly to our west you can see the kabada asset which is owned by a group called african gold group a tsx listed company uh, and then obviously directly to our south, you've got Jan Flila, obviously owned by Hummingbird Resources, who are one of our shareholders uh, and obviously my previous employer. I'm now going to dig into for a few slides the San Ancoro project um, and then obviously step away and, and go on some of our regional projects. So this is just zooming in a little bit on San Ancoro and the five permits, um, highlighting a lot of things I've been mentioning already, you know, close to 400 square kilometers of ground, uh, up to 100 meters depth of oxidization. SRK, obviously a well-renowned uh, resource company, have, have given us a, a, an exploration target of one to two million ounces of gold, limited to a vertical depth of 100 meters. Um, just to put that in context, we've, we've drilled mineralization down to depths of 170 meters to date. So that SRK exploration target is, no mean, no, is by no means the total potential um, gold discovery there. That, that's just limited to 100 meters. Uh, of that one to two million ounces, we brought um, 260,000 ounces into inferred resources on which we did our scoping study on. And obviously over the next six months, are looking to expand that significantly. Um, 
quick overview on our scoping study. Uh, we'll get into more details on the next page. As you can see at a $1,500 gold price, so fair bit below where we are today, extremely high IRR, um, a nice low CapEx, uh, generating good free cash flow generation. I think it's worth pointing one of the benefits of, of an oxide prop operation is ultimately your sustaining capital should remain lower. Uh, I think we, we've seen it all uh, in the past. You have companies which are relatively EBITDA rich, but, but they appear to be very cash poor because a lot of their money goes into reinvesting in sustaining capital. So you know, one of the benefits we're hoping for um, you know, with an oxide operation like this is that we can drive, I guess, true free cash flow uh, into the business. Um, obviously, significant shareholders and, and directors and management own, own a large chunk of this business. Um, so you know, we are very focused on shareholder return. Into a little bit more detail on the scoping study itself. Uh, I think probably useful to highlight here from a defensive perspective, if you, if you go down to a $1,300 gold price, which is you know, close to 500, 500 bucks or so away from where we are now per ounce, um, you're still looking at a 60% IRR project. So uh, I think in anyone's normal estimation, an extremely high return. Um, as you say, you know, I guess a few pictures there as well, you can see from us operating nice pictures of the drill rig and, and in some of the old historical artisanal pits where you can see this, this oxide material. Um, just to say our resource statements have been depleted to 15 meters. So it takes into account that, that top chunk, which has been taken out by artisanal miners, which uh, are pretty good exploration just to, to help us find even more gold. This is a, a zoom in on our permit area. The, the red blobs are essentially the resources. Um, and that's essentially limited by drilling. So, so at the moment, we, aren't expect, we are expecting to be able to join up a lot of those red dots um, and blobs and, and continue the growth of the resources. I think it's important to say we've, we've literally drilled less than 20% of the surface uh, mineralization to date. Uh, and we've also ended a significant number of our holes in mineralization. So not only do we expect to, to increase our resources at depth, but we're also expecting to find you know, significant ex ex uh, structural extensions to our existing resources as well. So. Plenty of upside from where we're at now, which we're obviously looking to, to exploit over the coming months. I don't want to get too technical um, right now, and I guess a bit like Paul, I'm not a, not a geologist by background, although I guess having lived and worked in West Africa uh, with Hummingbird and now Cora for 11, 12 years, um, you, you get to learn a little bit. But I think what you can see here are just pulling out a few drill holes. You've got some, some really good grade uh, and some really good widths of mineralization as well. Um, that's sailing in particular, I mean, 46 meters at, at four and a half grams a ton from 50 meters of depth and 70 meters at five grams a ton. Those are, are really good um, drill holes, frankly. Uh, what you want is nice wide um, widths of mineralization uh, as near to surface as possible, frankly, uh, which means that you can frankly dig it up cheaper uh, and get to it more quickly. So that's what I want to see more of as we drill further is, is nice um, big wide mineralization and, and some decent grade uh, as near to surface as possible. So. Fingers crossed for, for a lot more of that to come with, with future drilling programs. Current timeline, uh, it's pretty aggressive, uh, which we're pleased about. Uh, we started our ESIA early this year on the basis that we're looking to really fast track this project. Uh, we brought out the scoping study in Q1. Uh, we've been drilling uh, and we're looking to complete a feasibility study by the end of next year. Um, so in terms of keeping that timeline, uh, we need to be hitting the ground running with drilling. We, we kicked off a program at DACO uh, and obviously recently at Tegan as well, which has been announced, uh, looking to be drilling right through pretty hard till, till April time next year. And, and hopefully we bring out an updated resource statement um, in the middle of next year. Uh, and then obviously following up with a feasibility study as well. Um, been meeting with relevant consultants and varying engineering firms and other people to, to make sure we're, we're right on track with that. But hoping to be in construction of the mine in 2022, um, following completion of the feasibility study with, with permitting and financing in place. Donald mentioned it and I talked about it briefly, but um, I think it's significant to, to cover off uh, again, uh, the financing package we put in place with Lionhead. Uh, this is due to kick in on completion of a feasibility study at the end of next year. Uh, and on the basis of our scoping study economics uh, and capital requirement, it would fully finance the project. Uh, essentially half debt, half equity. Um, the convertible loan note is at a 30% premium to the equity um, and the debt is and the debt is at a, a flat 10% interest rate. Um, so very competitive financing. Uh, I think when you look at single asset juniors in Africa, um, debt's probably being priced somewhere in the sort of mid-teens. Um, so this is a, a very, um, a very 
positive financing package um, put in place with a group linked with our with our major shareholders. So you know, they have a vested interest in in, you know, in their own holding group doing well. So really pleased to have this partnership uh, and looking forward to, to helping us deliver the project um, in the future. Moving away from San Encaro, so I'm just looking at my clock there to see how long I've been going on for. Uh, moving away from San Encaro onto the Yanfalila area. Uh, this is where we just commenced drilling uh, yesterday. Uh, we just commenced drilling on the Tagan permit and obviously then looking to, to move down further south and, and, and drill Tekaladugu and Farasaba as well. We essentially created a, a bit of a ring of permits around the Yanfalila gold mine. Uh, I think the really exciting thing about this is, I guess, twofold. One, you've got existing discoveries, which, which are significant, which we're looking to be following up on. Uh, and I think secondly, when you have such proximity to an operating gold mine, any discovery is increased its potential by, by that. Uh, I think we all know that building mines is an expensive business. Uh, and ultimately, if you've got good discoveries near an existing mine, particularly if the mine's in operation, and obviously all mines have a limited mine life to a degree, um, you know, that, that could increase the value of any discovery you make. Uh, and also, if you were to make a, a slightly smaller discovery, which may not be economic on a standalone basis, it, it increases the chances of, of, of its economic benefit. So for me, it's great to get the drill rig going again down there uh, and to get kicking on with, um, with, with, with drilling. And just to highlight, yeah, I mean, Tekladugu is within eight kilometers of the Alphalila gold plant. It's actually within two kilometers of the mine infrastructure. So it's extremely close, uh, extremely close to the Alphalila. So Kenny Ava window, uh, West Mali and Senegal, uh, right on the border. Uh, as I mentioned, we were drilling Medina Fulbe earlier this year. Unfortunately, had to pause that uh, because of COVID. Uh, looking to get back now, we've just reopened the field camp. What we've had at Medina Fulbe today is, is some nice big wide chunks of mineralization from, from near surface. The grade's been a little bit lower than we would have hoped so far, but it's a, it's a big size permit. Medina full base, 250 square kilometers, and we've only drilled four or five holes, so nothing really. Um, so we're great to see a mineralized structure there. Uh, we're in amongst some, some significant major gold mines um, for Africa. So we, we are right in the right location, um, and our team's got great experience of making discoveries. Um, some of our team were involved in the Mako discovery back uh, before it was owned by Toro. So they really know this area and, and are looking to get stuck um, right back into it. Quick overview of Mali and Senegal. Uh, I think they're both extremely prospective regions, um, countries in the region. They've, they've had commercial gold mining industries for, for over 25, 30 years. Uh, that's great for a number of reasons. You've got a really skilled local workforce. So we were, you know, touch wood, unaffected by COVID, uh, as you know, all of our employees are, are Marlean, bar, bar Norm Bailey, who, who's out on site now. So you've got a team on the ground who, who can run operations uh, without the need to have lots of expats. Um, in terms of infrastructure, power, roads, uh, yeah, driving to our site at San Ancora, you run a tarmac road uh, to within an hour of site. So relatively easy to get to, which is great, uh, and obviously established mining codes and other things. So I think it's fair to say whilst um, the southern part of Mali where we're based has, has been obviously safe. I think there's obviously, uh, there has been some turmoil in the very north of Mali, but it's, it's well over a thousand kilometers from us. Um, and uh, I think it's just worth noting that obviously no operating gold mine has, has lost a day's production for any, any issues, um, civil unrest or, or such worse things um, in the last 25 years in Mali. So for us, we're, we're happy where we're located in very prolific regions and that they're great countries to be operating in. Community development is extremely important. Um, I probably won't dwell on it for long in this presentation, but welcome to take any phone calls from people in the coming days if they want to speak more about it. Uh, it's extremely important to, to operate in the best practice as you can. And we've you know, engaged predominantly around um, healthcare, education, uh, and alternative livelihoods to date. Uh, just catching up with the team last week on site about some of the projects we're doing. Market Gardens, um, some small um, for-profit businesses, we've helped them set up. Uh, as well as other things around healthcare as well. So it's great to see that the work we're doing on the ground and it's great to have uh, good local communities to be working in and amongst. Quick overview, obviously, as you know, Aim listed company um, listed back towards the end of 2017. Uh, I think a very strong share register, uh, tightly held. Uh, the Quirk family, uh, Lord Farmer is a co-founder of Red Kite, which is a mine finance and commodity trading business, uh, and obviously Hummingbird, um, up there as well. So you've got a very tight register. The directors hold um, around 8% of the business. So again, like Power Metal, you know, strong director holdings. 
Um, so I think on this basis, uh, we're well set up. The shareholders have been supported when we have had to raise money. And obviously some of the shareholders are behind uh, the term sheets looking to finance us in the future, uh, but always keen to, to grow the share register and meet new shareholders. So um, hopefully a few of you might, might be interested to join the share register after this evening. And obviously always open to take calls or emails from anyone if you've got any questions. Just last couple of slides here. Um, look, we feel we've got huge amounts of upside. Uh, I'm looking forward to over obviously tonight and obviously in the coming weeks, getting out there and then telling everyone about my site visit and updating existing holders and, and speaking to plenty of people about what's been going on on the ground because we're starting to make some really good strides. Um, and we think there's a huge amount of upside from where we're sat today. And just finally, uh, look, I've, I've talked about it already. So I'll just, just overview it. San Encoro is our major project. Um, it's got a great high, high return project, um, even at a more conservative gold price than right now. We've got a large footprint, uh, which gives us great opportunity to make big discoveries in the highly prospective region. And significantly, we've got a great cash position, $5 million in the bank, uh, and a $21 million funding term sheet to help us deliver the San Encoro project on completion of the feasibility study. Uh, we feel a really strong team on the ground delivering the work. So we feel we're in a really good place, uh, well set up to, to drive, the, drive the company forward with, with the projects we've got. So thanks very much for, for listening, guys. And I'll uh, look forward to taking any questions. Thank you, Bert. Well, uh, well done, you. That was, uh, was very interesting. Um, you've already answered the why Jan Fulila uh, uh, question, which has come in. But I, how much will the Jan Fulila drilling program uh, cost? It has already begun. And, and what's, the, what's the, the strategic thinking behind it? Why not simply focus on San Ancoro, which you know is highly prospective? Well, I think, uh, I guess, well, in terms of the drilling program, it's about a 5,000 metre program once we've, we've gone through the various permits. In terms of our regional exploration budget, we've given it around half a million dollars um, to be drilled over the course of the next six months. So that's covering both um, the Anfalila area, but it's also covering Medina Full Bay um, as well. These holes are relatively shallow um, initially, and they're also into soft oxide. So the rate you get is, is pretty affordable. So we're looking to be drilling, you know, looking to drill out Medina Full Bay as well as the Anfalila area uh, and other regional exploration at an earlier stage pre-drilling for, for under half a million dollars. In terms of the strategy of why we're doing it, I mean, I think ultimately it's an important facet of, of Cora. We are an exploration business. Uh, we aren't just a project development business. Uh, I think, as we've seen, um, a single exploration hole can completely transform a company. I mean, one, one exploration hole could make your share price move by an absolute magnitude if it was an absolute uh, amazing hole. Uh, and I think to do our portfolio justice, you need to get boots on the ground and, and get out there and explore. Uh, obviously, we, we have got a, a very strong cash position at the moment and feel comfortable in, in engaging and doing that work and hopefully giving our shareholders that that optionality and that opportunity to, to make new discoveries uh, and, and push forward in that way, as well as carry on and do all the necessary work at San Encoro. Uh, and I think the final part about obviously Hummingbird and Yanfleeder, I mean, ultimately it's a strategic positioning. Those permits, they're very close to an operating mine. Um, so it's always useful. I mean, you've seen historically it going well. I mean, there was a company called Borimium, for example, which then turned into Marley Lithium and it's now called Farfinch. And they had a, they had a permit which, which was around the Marilla mine and they, they found a very small resource, but ultimately got a very good toll treatment deal with it and actually ended up self-funding a huge amount of their exploration work and, and even feasibility studies on, on one of their other projects. So I think a uh, you know, relatively modest investment um, could give us a great reward and a great return on money. And where does the funding come from, from that relatively modest investment? Well, our existing cash, sorry. So, I mean, our cash of half of, of $5 million in the bank. So that was, I mean, ultimately we, we had a fundraise earlier in the year back in uh, March time. Uh, and then ultimately we also had some warrants outstanding, which we now have, no longer have any warrants outstanding, but we had some warrants which were in the money and were cashed in um, through August and September of this year. So that, that's why we have $5 million in the bank. Okay. Um, and, uh, in terms of management stretch, the, the classic, you know, small aim listed company, uh, you're trying to deliver the Sun and Code of feasibility study which without, without which you don't get your term sheet funding of $21 million. So, you know, might you be overstretching yourself? I mean, obviously, uh, in, ter well, in terms of trying to manage regional programs as well as yes. San Encoro, or in terms of my time? Well, in terms of everybody's time, there's, you know, at the end of the day, it's a relatively uh, small team and you're adding more and more uh, uh, work into it. Is it yeah, I think, it I think I guess it's worth mentioning. I mean, ultimately, we, we were quite COVID compliant before COVID happened. We've got no head office in the UK, which is great from an overhead perspective. There's myself and a CFO. Uh, we have a head of exploration who's, who's now predominantly based at site. 
within Mali, we've got a team of 12 geologists. Um, they're allocated by project. So we, we've always had a regional team. It's made up of, of, of a senior geologist and a couple of junior geos. So essentially you, you've got a regional exploration team which manages those programs and they're essentially siloed off San and Coro. So 80, 90% of our team is focused at, San, focused at San and Coro and that is the focus of, of really all of our work. Uh, the drilling is contracted out to, to external drilling companies and essentially you have a, an isolated unit which, which travels around and, and manages these regional programs. So they're essentially a separate silo. So yeah, I, I don't see there being any conflict or, or, or any distraction uh, is probably a better expression to use there. Uh, but obviously it's, it's obviously worth noting. I've brought in some additional help as we've moved San Coro forward. You might've seen on the contacts page, Russell Bradford was there as an advisor. Um, he's a very experienced mind builder in Africa. So he's been helping advise me and support me in terms of moving the project from an exploration business into a development business as we're looking to do. I've also got a couple of other guys in the background who, are, who I know from my home bird days who have been helping various aspects of specific bits, whether it's the environmental and social element, which is obviously a specific skill set and, and such like. So, no, I feel we, we, we're well set up and we've got we've got the team to deliver what we need to. OK, that was a good answer. Uh, Paul Sapsford uh, asks, uh, Bert, an environmental question. Once any open mine exploration or exploitation is complete, what plans do you have to repair or recover the land? I mean, that will all obviously come in as part of our um, environmental permit, which we'll need to get alongside a mining permit. So currently we've engaged Digby Wells, so an international organization who's currently doing our environmental social impact assessment. Part of that will be building um, a framework for rehabilitation at the end of the mine life, or even during the mine life and the end of the mine life. Um, ultimately, for different areas of the mine, it, it, it comes in different ways. Obviously, there's, there's reforestation, which needs to go on. There's pit rehabilitation, which needs to go on. Um, so it's all interlinked. Uh, ultimately, for me, it, it, it's, it's actually really interesting. And a, a part I find fascinating about this business, I think people often say what's great about being in the mining world. And I think, you know, you, when you get to go to amazing places in the world, you get to work with lots of interesting people. It's so multifaceted. And I think this, how the environment and the social element of this industry engages uh, with the mine itself is, is, is massively important. I spend quite a lot of time on it. I certainly had, I mean, I had a two hour call on it today, for example, with the team um, engaging around the social and environmental side of things. So, um, but obviously it, it will all come out as part of that, that environmental permit uh, and out of that environmental report uh, over the course of um, next year, really. Okay, let me ask you a final, final question here. How do you think your all-in cost of production, uh, the gentleman says $950, um, and I compares with other, other locations, Australia, Asia, Americas, et cetera? To be honest, I was actually pretty disappointed with our all-in cost of production. I think, um, and I'll be looking to improve it, I think uh, the nature of a, of a scoping study- they, How can you improve it? That was one of my other questions. How can you improve your all-in production costs? So we and, ex and extend the, the, the mine life at San Ancoro. Yeah, exactly. So I think one, the conservatism, which is in our scoping study, which I would be looking to move forward is one is the pit slopes. So the pit slopes in my mind are very shallow. Uh, if you look at some mines near us, uh, they're mining at 40 degree pit slopes. Our scoping study is estimating 34 degree pit slopes. So as you increase your pit slopes, um, you reduce the amount of waste you need to move. So our strip ratio is currently forecast to be five and a half to six to one strip ratio. So five and a half to six bits of waste to every bit of ore. Uh, if you tighten it up to 40 degree pit slopes, it'll probably reduce to somewhere around four to one. So you'd reduce the amount of waste you're moving, reduce your mining cost. Mining costs are normally the most significant, most significant single operating cost. So my hope would be to, through geotechnical test work, to prove that we could mine like similar mines in the region at a steeper pit slope, steeper than 34 degrees and hopefully up towards 40 degrees. Um, the other one is, as you say, scale. At the moment, the, sh the mine life is relatively short. As you can show a longer mine life, you get the benefit of the economies of scale, whether it's you know, the cost of power being spread over a longer period of time, um, you know, other factors around that. So for me, that's uh, a big area we can improve on and I hope we can improve. Um, I think to answer the first part of the gentleman's question, um, the global average all-in sustaining cost for the gold mining sector is around a thousand to a thousand and fifty dollars an ounce is my understanding. Um, but obviously, that takes into account probably the older mines, which are much deeper, where it's a higher cost. For us, we're, we're mining shallow oxides. We should have a really low all in sustaining cost because the mining contractor should be giving you a really good rate because you're digging up ore from surface and it's free digging. You don't have to blast it. It's, it's light, it should be easy. So that's a big area I'm gonna be focusing on. If I could quickly interject with a, a question which fits perfectly in from Gladstone Hammond. 
he asks, what's the cost of producing a, a, an ounce of gold in Mali? Well, it depends. And well, it depends which mine you are. I mean, I think, um, you know, there are examples, I think, for Cola, for example, owned by B2, I think their all in sustaining cost is, is around $600 to $650 an ounce. And there are obviously examples of mines which have all in sustaining costs of over $1,000 an ounce. Uh, if we can be below $800, if we can be below $850 to $800 an ounce production, you know, if you're making in this gold price environment $1,000 an ounce margin and you're doing 50,000 ounces production a year conservatively, uh, you're making a hell of a lot of money, which will, which will be great. Okay, let me be cheeky and ask you a final, final question. Final, um, final. How many final questions do you get? I'm, I'm, I'm bad. I accept that. That's all right. Um, the, the, has the recent change of government in Mali made a difference to you? I actually met the new minister last week. He is a very nice guy, actually. So I had a great meeting with him. Um, to be honest, you know, you've got your expiration permits, and this, you know, there's, it hasn't made a difference to us in, in a sense. Uh, I mean, everyone's generally been saying good things about the new government. Hasn't made a big difference to us. For us. The big thing for me will be Q4 next year when we're delivering a feasibility study and we'll be looking to convert exploration permits into a mining permit and locking in your 25-year, 10-year mining agreement. So for me, that'll be the big time when, when we need to, to, to engage with the government um, really, really actively and, and make sure we're moving forward with, those, with, with the permitting as, as well as we can. Bert Munro, thank you very much indeed. Uh, you were very patient with us. Thank you so much uh, for sparing the time. And for Not at all. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. Good to, good to be here. And uh, yeah, hopefully look forward to meeting some of you when we return to some form of normality, hopefully in 2021. Lots of great questions. Not all of whom we managed to get to, despite them being good questions. So apologies oh. to everyone that we didn't quite get to. Anyone I didn't answer, feel free to uh, email me if you want or give me a We call. have literally run out, run out of time there, Bert. Thank you. Thank right. you so much. And uh, now we welcome Colin Harrington. Uh, let, me, how are you? let me introduce you, Colin. Uh, Colin is CEO of Zephyr Energy, an aim-listed oil and gas company focused on responsible development in the Rocky Mountain region of the United States. I'm sure you all know about the Rocky Mountains. Previously known as Rose Petroleum, Zephyr now has a new management in the shape of Colin. He's the CEO and his team. It has a new strategy and it's funded. It recently won a $2 million US government grant uh, to drill a research well in the Paradox Basin, uh, which is in Utah, and Zephyr are preparing to spud the well before the year ends. No doubt Colin will tell us all about that. Uh, Zephyr has recently raised $2.25 in a share placing, and indeed Colin has invested his own money in the project. Here we go. Colin is, Colin's uh, screen is quite slow to, uh, to load. So yes. We've, the, so we've, uh, we've given him a few, a few extra seconds there. <laughs> It's the transatlantic screen share is not always uh, as rapid as you'd like. How is that? Has it it's come the, trans up? the transatlantic lag. Colin, yeah. it's up and it's it's running and it's looking it's looking very stable. Over to you. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, Donald, and thank you everybody for joining in tonight. We really appreciate your time. Um, I'll speak tonight about the background of Zephyr and, and what I've seen as the investment opportunity give you a sense of the mission and the team, um, talk you through our primary asset, which as Donald mentioned, we're, we're just kicking off operational activity in, and then give you a summary uh, of my view on value and, and next steps. So, you know, Zephyr, as you mentioned, Donald, we're an oil and gas company. We're focused on the Rocky Mountain basins in the American West. Uh, many of you will know the predecessor to the company, Rose Petroleum, which has been listed uh, since 2004. I became involved in Rose uh, in May of last year, and I became involved as an investor first. Uh, so sitting in your shoes, evaluating the company, and uh, we were invited to, to provide investment capital and some management expertise and, and boots on the ground in this area. We did a significant amount of technical and commercial due diligence uh, and elected to make this investment. And I'm now uh, serving as Zephyr CEO. So let me walk you through the opportunity I saw then and then tell you what we've been doing since to, uh, to give you a sense of our philosophy and our uh, operations going forward. Um, our goal, when, when my partners and I stepped in to make this investment, we perceived that there was a significant gap in valuation between what the market cap was and what the potential upside was. Um, we saw a market cap that was less than what the company had spent historically on just the seismic costs of their Paradox asset. And this is the Paradox base in Utah. 
certainly a lot less than they'd spent trying to develop that and buy the leases or lease the leases in Utah over the years. There was also about uh, just under $15 million of tax loss assets in the company, which are uh, from the perspective of a US investor could be uh, very effective in helping us acquire production or near term development going forward. And then we looked at what could be at the Paradox asset just in the Cane Creek Reservoir alone. And the Cane Creek is what uh, is, has been dominantly and historically produced in Utah. And the company had a, a reserve report done with a 2C basis, a PV10 of the Cane Creek of $50 million. That was just you know, $45 oil flat. That was just in that one reservoir. There are five other reservoirs that they see on their, their 3D seismic, but haven't really been understood yet. So we saw from a market cap of under $3 million, the potential to significantly increase that. But we also knew there'd be a lot of work involved in, in getting this done. And that's what we've been undertaking over the last year. So, sorry about that. So how do we bridge this valuation gap? How do we get closer to what we think the asset value is here? We've started by, uh, appointing four new members to the board. So four of the five board members are new. A majority of them are independent non-execs and everybody's got turnaround experience. Everybody has uh, deep energy sector EMP experience. Uh, we've got a new executive management team with a lot of experience on the US onshore, onshore side. We've tightened the focus of the company. It was spread across geographies and sectors and we've re restructured and refocused just to get down to the core assets, which will be uh, EMP in the American West. We closed other subsidiaries and sold off assets um, in an effort to make it a clean uh, focused vehicle. We've gone out and gotten partnerships and I'll talk a lot about this later uh, with some world-class institutions, even the US government and, and significant operators in the West. We've deployed a fair amount of, of uh, capability of time and effort and capital into bulking up the technical resources uh, because our team's a big believer that, that location and understanding the subsurface is the biggest driver of value in this sector. So we, we put a lot of time and effort into that. The board has stepped up and we've bought a million and a half dollars worth of shares in this company. So I think you've heard from other investors tonight in a similar vein, we strongly believe that board management needs to be aligned with shareholders this board owns 20% overall of the shares outstanding. And finally, what we've done is uh, we've, we've renamed the company and we've really launched with a core belief around ESG to reflect uh, you know, what we see as the market going forward and what the right way to operate is. So going forward, singular focus on the American West, oil and gas development, primarily Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado. We're kicking off the phase one development of our Paradox Basin asset, um, and we're drilling a well by year end there. We're going to continue to leverage larger organizations, both for capital and knowledge, uh, because we are a small, low cost uh, entity ourselves. Um, we are looking to grow, to utilize those tax losses and, and grow through acquisitions of either production or near term production assets to, to gain additional cash flow. And we're gonna be very strong and proactive in focusing on our relationships with uh, all of our stakeholders, but particularly the communities in which we operate. So next, uh, let me talk about the mission and the team. And these are the slides that uh, don't, don't give me a lot of popularity with my compatriots here in the US sector. But I think it's important to point out uh, because again, sitting in my investor seat, the last decade in the U.S. onshore EMP uh, sector has been uh, a disaster from an economic standpoint. The U.S. EMP industry was the worst performing sector of the public markets in the last decade, and that's stripping out uh, commodity price cycles, stripping out COVID. Um, there were some fundamental flaws in the business model here. Uh, one was a, a focus on production growth versus cash flows. Um, you had compensation packages that also focused on production and acreage growth rather than cash flow or value growth. Um, acreage growth uh, without a real understanding of the rock beneath those acreages, uh, acreage positions. So that resulted in a lot of sub-economic drilling outside of core basins. And I think by and large, the, the largest single problem here was just easy access to debt 
which meant that so many of the small to mid and even large cap companies in the EMP space in the US uh, were massively over leveraged. And now you're seeing the result, you know, wave of bankruptcies and, and zombie companies that are out there. If the economic side wasn't the only problem uh, in the US, the environmental impact from the sector has been uh, significant as well. Again, just a couple examples. Uh, widespread flaring of gas, uh, which not only puts carbon straight up into the atmosphere, but, but companies lose the revenue that's associated with that gas. Emissions monitoring that's sporadic, um, poor local community relationships, uh, surface footprints that are extensive and scarring, uh, even a lot of freshwater fracking in areas with drought. These are all practices that, that are problematic and are certainly contrary to what we'll do. We look at things very differently. We will be responsible developers of these resources, two focuses, a mission to be responsible stewards of investors' capital. So low fixed costs, very little, if any, use of leverage, uh, a management team that's allied to, you know, aligned to get their value uh, from, from share growth rather than production targets, um, and a goal to return capital when we can to our shareholders. And again, as 20% shareholders, the board is aligned in this, in this view. Secondly, on the environment, um, we believe that ESG practices are, are both environmentally sound, but also economically sound. We're not going to participate in projects with flaring. We're constantly evaluating new technologies like emissions monitoring to make sure that our sites and the communities around our sites are operating appropriately. Um, we commit to minimize our land footprint in places where we work. And lastly, and this is a key point, I wanted a very strong and independent board to sit on top of management, not only to be able to utilize the relationship and, and skill sets, but also to make sure that the management has the appropriate oversight. So I'll walk you through the board quickly. Bios are on the website, um, but you know what I can say is we've assembled this board not just for the skills and expertise, but, but everybody here has had successful turnaround experience as well. And that clearly was what was needed uh, within Rose now Zephyr. Uh, Rick Grant is our chairman. He was previously the CEO of one of the world's largest natural gas companies, the distribution companies that was Suez LNG. He's also had a number of very successful exits uh, in the energy sector. And we're thrilled to have him on board. Uh, Tom Reynolds is current CEO of Scirocco. He also has significant AIM experience, significant private equity experience through 3i and 25 years in the sector. Um, Gordon Steen, many of you may know, again, highly experienced in the AIM sector, but has also done a fair amount with North American private investors as well. And he's been parachuted into a number of turnaround stories, uh, including Regal uh, and Cadogan. In each case, uh, you know, going into distressed entities and, and delivering uh, share price growth for investors. There are independents and, and great to have on board. I've been in the sector 25 years, uh, most recently co-founded a, a Rockies based EMP, which is our sector of focus. Um, we went from startup to production in under a year and then had a very successful monetization of the asset. We have Chris Eady, who uh, has been with Rose since 2014. Now Zephyr runs a very tight, clean uh, finance operation and has uh, not only is a chartered accountant, but has a number of years in the sector. Uh, Gregor Maxwell is the head of our subsurface, has worked in senior roles at Chevron and Apache and RockSource, and is responsible for everything we're doing from an analytics perspective and a technical perspective. So our growth and the path forward, um, you know, we're starting with this clean public shell. We've got no debt, very low fixed costs, and our current holdings are twofold. It's the Paradox Basin asset where we have 25,000 acres. Um, we've got a very recent 3D seismic shoot across that position. We have a partnership with uh, the University of Utah's Energy and Geoscience Institute and the DOE who are contributing capital and time to our project there. Uh, and that's in the form of a $2 million grant, which uh, we're using to kick off uh, operations in Utah. We also have an option on a horizontal development in Colorado. This is something that's alongside one of uh, the DJ Basin's best uh, operators and, and most effective operators. That's something that uh, in, in the earlier uh, oil and price environment from this year, probably not something that would have been pursued, but we are seeing costs come down across the sector in Colorado. We'll continue to watch this and there's potential for that to be drilled in 2021. 
But for today, what I'd really like to do is talk about uh, what we're doing in the paradox, how we're taking something uh, with a strong core, really trying to reduce risk and increase the, the size, the magnitude of the upside here. So Paradox Basin, um, as I said before, we have 20,000, 25,000 acres. And unlike what you see across most US plays, this is a natural fracture play. So what I mean by that is it doesn't utilize artificial fracturing. There's no completion at the end. So it has significant potential uh, to improve well economics because uh, you're, you're, you're losing about half the capex. You're not having to spend about the half the capex that would be involved in a standard horizontal artificially fr fracked well. Um, this is a prolific basin historically, but the wells that have successfully and have been successful intersect natural fractures. And when they do that, when they hit a natural fracture, the IP rates and the ultimate recovers ha have been substantial. But uh, there's been a mixed track record. It's been historically about one and two, or just a little bit better than that, that have, uh, that have come in, have been economic. And that's primarily been due to a lack of technology and old technology and older geologic understanding in this basin. So recent things that change that, that can help improve our rates here are a move from 2D to 3D and, and especially modern 3D seismic. The introduction of uh, horizontal drilling and particularly the improvements in directional drilling, which will help target these, these natural fractures in a much more effective way. These fractures, these technologies haven't been tested yet in the paradox. But as I said before, the company historically has spent $3 million on a very high resolution 3D seismic shoot. And combined with some of the information that we're gonna learn from our upcoming vertical uh, drill, which is happening this month, it'll give us the insight to de-risk uh, this area and to delineate our future development. So we're very excited about uh, the potential here. Um, just to show you the, the production history in the Paradox Basin. As I said, uh, you know, it's produced since the 60s. And you can see on our chart here, uh, Long Canyon was a vertical well it kicked off. It's still producing today. Um, there have been 10 million barrels produced overall from the Cane Creek Reservoir, which is one of the reservoirs in the Paradox Basin uh, to date. As I said before, you have high rate wells when they come in, IPs of 500 barrels or more, sometimes 1500 barrels or more a day, but the success rates have been uh, 50 to 60%. So what we see here in early 2001 and 2011 were uh, early 3D seismic surveys, which helped uh, Intrepid and Fidelity significantly increase the production from this area. Um, but again, as we've seen, targeting still was a bit hit or miss. Um, peak, peak production in this area was 5,000 barrels a day in 2014. Um, since then, I would say it's really been overlooked uh, when, when, because it wasn't a unconventional fracking play, what we've seen is uh, most companies going and getting acreage otherwise, and there hasn't been a lot, a lot of activity on the paradox since. So I'm gonna talk about our grant here. The grant is incredibly important. It's the Department of Energy funding the University of Utah's EGI, Energy and Geosciences Institute, which is one of the leading geology uh, research organizations here in the US. And this grant funding is going to help us by combining our 3D seismic with logs and cores that we get from a vertical well to help us de-risk the future development and improve the success rates to move from that 50 to 60% rate up to something much higher. And it does this at an extremely low cost to Zephyr. It also accelerates our development uh, timeframe because it means we're gonna be drilling by the end of this year. So the grant details, we have $2 million uh, in non-dilutive grant funding. It's to be used to spot a vertical well. As I said, it's gonna be this year. The overall cost of the well will be two and a half to 3 million. We will cover the extra two, uh, 0.5 to $1 million. And the primary objective of this well, as I said, is to get the logs and continuous core. Um, but secondarily, we'll be able to reutilize this well to drill a horizontal lateral in future days. And um, it will significantly reduce that future uh, drilling from 6 million down to 3 million. Uh, just a quick illustration of what I'm talking about here. This black line is going to be the vertical well that comes down to about 10,000 feet. It pierces a number of clastics, a number of reservoirs that are not as well understood to get down to the Cane Creek, which has been the biggest producer over the years. Um, once we get the logs from and, and cores from the Cane Creek and these other clastics, 
will temporarily abandon the well here at the 9 and 5 8 shoe. Now, it allows us to go back in uh, at a later date, should we decide the logs and the cores are strong enough and develop this out horizontally to target that Cane Creek again. Uh, it's going to significantly de-risk those efforts. And again, you know, not only will our footprint be much smaller on the surface, but it reduces the capex to drill that future horizontal by about 50%. Our location, it's a current Zephyr lease. It's under our 3D seismic. Uh, there are existing roadways and an existing pad, so we minimize our environmental impact. And uh, it's got very good highway access uh, close to service centers in, in Vernal and Grand Junction, Colorado. And as you can see, we've been out there this week completing the road works. Uh, we, we, we made sure the roads were in decent shape to bring in uh, the trucks and tankers that we'll be bringing in. And the site uh, prep has all been completed as well, which is the bottom three pictures. Uh, as Donald mentioned, we funded uh, our portion of the commitment, the $1 million commitment by raising money in October. We raised 2.25 million pounds, uh, significantly oversubscribed. We had a range of old investors, including the board, new investors and, and institutional investors alongside as well, really gratified with the support and we look forward to, to uh, delivering value uh, for them. And importantly, that fundraise unlocked the additional $2 million in grant funding. Uh, we've already brought down the first 600,000 of that to date. So to summarize and give you a view on value, just to boil it all down again to the hard numbers, for a $1 million commitment to this well, Zephyr gets to unlock $2 million of grant funding. So that's funding that uh, has no other strings attached to it. Uh, and utilizing the 1 million of our capital, the $2 million of grant, and the 3 million in seismic that previously was shot, we think will go a long way to bridging this market cap, uh, currently just under $6 million today, to get much closer to what the PV10 of the Cane Creek is. And again, that's a 2C basis, 45 million, and that's an independent report. But more importantly, the, the logs that we get will help us define the five other reservoirs that we see on our 3D seismic. Um, we haven't defined those yet. We'll be able to do that after we uh, have those logs, but if they're viable, that would provide significant other upside just from this paradox leasehold alone. So we're working hard and carefully to get this well drilled. Um, as I said, we'll, we'll be sputting by year end. Uh, you should see rig contract and permits, and permits uh, coming very soon. The drill time is uh, 30 to 40 days once we spud. And after that time, we'll have a one to three month period to review the data that's been acquired, uh, to review the logs, review the cores, and to make a decision whether we'll proceed to a horizontal. Uh, if we do that, that horizontal will be aimed at a top production target. Uh, the options to finance that could come from a farm out partner, uh, which we're, we're obviously in, in discussions. We have tax driven investors that are considering partnering with us, financial partners as well. Uh, we'll also consider PLC funding. Um, obviously, everything we do is with my, my shareholder hat on trying to reduce risk to the current platform and, and obviously make the, the upside as large as possible for shareholders. You know, we're obviously also trying to seek attractive acquisitions uh, in this market. We've got a good team to go out and deliver those. No debt, no uh, production that's underwater today, no capital commitments that, that uh, are beyond our means. And as always, our capital in terms of the management and the board is alongside investors' capital, and we look forward uh, we look forward to growing it significantly in the coming months here. And with that, Donald, thank you, and thank you, everyone. Well, Colin Harrington, that was a, an unusually thoughtful presentation from an oil and gas man, I have to say. <laughs> I thought you were going to say from an American, and and that concerned me even more. No, no, there are many thoughtful Americans, but that was that was very interesting and. Uh, a real a real joy. Thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you there. Um, let's kick off the Q&A by asking, uh, I, I sense that you don't want to give us a, a, a drill date, a date for the spud. Is that correct? It's, 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 it's probably commercially sensitive, is it? Well, no, we, we, we've said we will be spudding by the end of the year and we firmly you know, expect to stick to that time frame. Uh, there's a lot of build up to this, uh, you know, everything from, you know, the the negotiation of the uh, agreements for the grant funding 
through to permitting, through to contracting. Uh, and we have a number of stakeholders involved in this as well, including the US government. Um, so all that being said, uh, we're making great progress and we've assembled a really good team to help us get to that point. So, so there you go. I was going to ask you, you've presumably that's what you're doing at the moment. You're pulling together the team and it's just about ready to go. Absolutely. And, and one of the things we've done, uh, which, which has provided me the most comfort as, a, as an investor, is that the single most successful company that historically worked in this basin was called Fidelity Exploration. And Fidelity had a team that drilled uh, most of the pr productive wells out here. We've hired a number of the ex-Fidelity team to help us drill this initial well. So Bruce Hutchins, who was the drilling manager for Fidelity, has come on board uh, and is leading all of our efforts, and we have a, a good group underneath him. So, you know, not only is it is it local knowledge and good relationships already with uh, service providers out there, but it's just a, um, you know, I think it's the right team with a good understanding of this basin and, and the various, uh, you know, unique attributes of it. So we're, we're happy to have this team in place. Do you think this is more an appraisal well than an exploration well? Yes, yeah, I do, given the information that we have here. And again, you know, not to downplay it, the company spent historically a lot of money on this seismic shoot. Uh, is one of the things that attracted me most when considering to step in here. Uh, so that combined with, you know, actual rock from the cores and electric logs uh, from this well we're going to drill, I think will serve to significantly de-risk this project. And, and uh, yes, I think you'd absolutely quantify this as appraisal. Okay, and if you, if you like the results from the vertical well, uh, how long before you actually look to drill the horizontal portion? I think, you know, we, we, can, we will pursue that very quickly if we like the results from the first well. Because obviously one of my fundamental drivers is getting production into this company. And uh, conceivably with a, with a horizontal lateral off of this well, not only are we saving half the cost because half of it will have been uh, already done through the grant and our initial commitment, um, but I think, uh, I think we're feeling good about the environment that we're in at this point. So we have ongoing conversations, as I said, I never wanna be beholden to farm in conversations with much larger partners because we all know that that can be a long and drawn out process. But I think there's enough, uh, there are enough alternatives for us here to drill the second half that uh, we certainly would have a conversation with our shareholders about it. And we would, we would absolutely talk with uh, other financial partners and try to get this drilled expediently if we're excited about it. Uh, you know, would, we are, would that, would that include, de would that include debt and equity? Sorry, it could. Sorry. Would that include debt and equity? Um, I think typically companies our size get in trouble using, uh, using too much debt. Uh, particularly without other sources of cash flow here. So I'm uh, more averse to debt, but I think there are a combination of financing structures at the asset level that could help us uh, pursue this. Okay, uh, a question from the audience. Igor Afonin asks, what sort of oil have you discovered? Light, medium, or heavy? Well, I think that's part of what we will see here uh, from our courts. You know, we'll get an understanding of, of the qualities of the oil in this particular area. Uh, but particularly, this has been this has been uh, high high grade oil. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, please, this gentleman's been very polite. He's a long term shareholder, so for him to be very polite is quite a thing. <laughs> um, let me. It's called Jeff Richmond, and he's been he's he's been with um, Rose and and now Zephyr um, for fourteen years. So he's gone through a lot of misery, I suspect. Yep. Uh, he says he's more than ninety five percent down on a substantial, oh my goodness, five-figure investment. Um, but he believes in you, Colin. <laughs> he's, he's bought back into the company. Um, so multiple dilutions is part of the problem. How, he, 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 oh, here we go. He, how confident are you of avoiding future dilutions of note? What, and what do you see as the minimum viable oil price? Thank you. There you go. Well, he's a very patient man. Yeah, let's take the, the, the second part first, because that's an easy one. Uh, you know, we think that the, these wells will be economic below $30 oil. Um, again, because you're, well, twofold, you're not uh, completing them. So that saves some on the cap X, but particularly this first well, uh, where a lot of it will have been funded by the grant, um, the economics will, will be fantastic on the first well. Um, I think from a much broader perspective, 
I think you should know, again, as a shareholder and a 20% shareholder in this company, I am extremely sensitive to dilution as well. And it's something that uh, we will certainly work to avoid at all costs until the opportunity is right. And, and if we think, uh, you know, based on the logs and the cores, if we think this is something that a, a risk and with a potential reward that's, you know, much more sizable, we think that this is the right way forward, we will come to shareholders and, and talk about it at that point. Um, that being said, I do feel there are a number of ways to fund the second part of this well, and it doesn't necessarily involve dilution. And with my shareholder hat on, uh, and as somebody who's, whose value from this comes from growth in the share price, I completely understand where he's coming from and am, am in the same seat uh, as he is. Okay, uh, we're just about out of time. It seems yeah. to have really sped past, Colin. As I say, very thoughtful uh, presentation from you. You emphasized responsible uh, drilling. And uh, thankfully for you, there's no fracking uh, required in this well. So no, no, no one is, no is going to test your, uh, your, your empathy here. But if you, if, if you came across a fracking opportunity, which you thought was fantastic in the future, would, would you consider fracking? Sure, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to dissuade people from all fracking. It's just the nature of this project here. Um, so I think fracking done in an appropriate way in areas where uh, brownfield areas or areas that uh, you, you know, where it can be done properly, that's, that's absolutely acceptable. Um, the practices that I'm most concerned about are things like flaring, where you're just pumping methane up into the environment um, or freshwater fracking, for example, in areas where there's no freshwater. I, I, I'm a big believer in engagement with this industry rather than divestment. Certain people say, don't touch fossil fuels, um, you know, bad for the planet, global warming, et cetera. And, and I completely understand that and agree. Uh, but at the same time, fossil fuels are not going away. And I believe that if you engage with the industry, if you work and put in best practices from the inside that you can actually, you know, begin to make it a difference. And that, that may sound a bit idealistic, but I think, you know, we can demonstrate both with our natural fracture project or also by doing, uh, you know, appropriate and responsible fracking projects in places where it's acceptable. Uh, sure, of course, we would consider that for the right opportunity. And I don't think it is entirely idealistic anymore, Colin. Uh, from last year to this, things have entirely changed. Uh, yeah. And I think, you heard it here first. I think ESG is uh, is an, uh, becoming a mega trend. Yeah, I I I I completely understand it and believe it should. So uh, I, I'm aligned with that. Okay, Colin. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining. Donald, us. Thank you, Appreciate Colin Heinerton, CEO of Zephyr Energy. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye. And over to VR Education and David Whelan. Hi, afternoon everybody, thanks for staying. Greetings David, yes exactly, let's see how many people, yes, you've still got an audience David, they've not all gone away. Excellent, I'm just going to share my screen first, one sec. Great, and then okay. I'll, jump, I'll jump into my introduction to you. Okay. So VR Education is, is an early stage virtual reality software and technology group based in Waterford, Ireland. The presentation by CEO David Whelan will provide an overview of progress for the group's online virtual social learning and presentation platform, Engage, a platform group for creating, sharing, and delivering proprietary and third-party VR content. No doubt David will explain that in layman's terms as to what it actually means. VR education is listed on both AIM in London and the Enterprise Securities Market in Dublin. Over to you, David. Okay, thanks very much, um, Donald. So this presentation is quite short. I only have six or seven slides in total. Um, really what this presentation is really focused on is the delivery of Engage and the traction that we're receiving um, this year. And I'm gonna start with just a brief overview of the company. So I am David Whelan, I'm the CEO of VR Education. We're still quite a young company. Um, we're going about five years. And we are an Irish based company, hence you can hear the very strong Irish accent coming at you through your speakers right now. And um, there's two components to the company. The much smaller component of the company is our content development team. And they create what we call showcase 
game educational experiences. And these have been very popular for us in the past. We've released titles on the PlayStation Store, on the Oculus Store, on many of the, the main virtual reality stores. And these will be edutainment products. And some of the most popular titles we've had in the past have been Apollo 11, which is sold quite strongly, and Titanic VR, which is sold as well quite well. Actually, just today or yesterday, we released uh, Shuttle Commander, our next showcase experience. But that's a very small part of the business. And it's um, we have about three dedicated people building these showcase experiences. But the rest of our staff, we have 50, uh, 52 staff at the moment. Everybody else is dedicated to the Engage platform. Um, we've, we have some really strong partners and clients. Um, we working with the European Commission on the Engage platform. We work with Oxford University. Yahoo have, have held an event on the Engage platform and XPRIZE. And actually, if you have a look at that, that image you can see there on the right-hand side is from one of our partners, one of our very strong partners, HTC. Um, some of you might have read back in earlier this year, in the first half of this year, HTC held an event inside Engage, which was actually cancelled because of COVID-19. It was due to be held on the Chinese mainland. And obviously that was cancelled. Um, HTC came to us and asked, could they host the event virtually inside our Engage platform? We said, absolutely. And um, we hosted um, the, the, the event. And even before the event finished, um, I got a phone call from the, the president of HTC China um, with about an hour or two to go within the event. Uh, they wanted to invest in the company and they came in and they purchased a 20% stake in the company in the first half of this year, which I will talk about later in this presentation. Um, we have a quite strong board as well. We have um, the current uh, CEO of Virgin Ireland. Um, we also have the, the co-founder of Pixar. He's a, a non he's an advisory member to the board, Lauren Carpenter. Um, so just what is the Engage platform? I'm gonna play this video in the background. You're not gonna hear any audio. I'm just gonna talk over it. So the Engage platform, originally it was designed as a training and development platform. So over the past four years, we've been creating this platform with a mind of this is the virtual classroom where you can have students logged in from all over the world in a virtual environment, getting taught from the best teachers around the world. And that's how we proceeded to produce the platform um, over, over quite a few years. And then up until uh, last year, so um, last year just gone, Engage was primarily offered on PC-based VR devices where you would need a computer with a headset connected to the computer to actually experience Engage. But last year, Oculus released the Oculus Quest headset and HTC released the Vive Focus headset. These are standalone VR devices where you don't need a PC. You literally take it out of your bag, you put it on your head and you get a good end user experience Engage was released on those products um, earlier this year. And we've actually seen a big pickup in users. And I'm gonna talk about the user numbers and the revenue in a moment. But Engage has actually got more and more traction. And it's not just in the education space. We're actually seeing a lot of corporations using Engage for business meetings and events. We're hosting lots of conferences inside Engage as well. And even an event like today, we could host this inside Engage. Instead of you watching a video presentation and hearing my voice through the screen, we could actually be sitting in a virtual auditorium where I'm standing, giving a presentation um, up on a screen, going through a PowerPoint presentation. But the, the thing with Engage is that it can replicate everything you, you do in the real world. We can replicate that in the virtual world. So when you log in, there's a virtual version of you inside the platform. You can go, you can shake hands with somebody. You can give PowerPoint presentations, as I said. You can, you can bring in 3D objects because it is virtual reality. You can stream in any media from any web source. You can link it to Google Docs, OneDrive, and you can do PowerPoint presentations. And when COVID really hit hard in Ireland, um, back in March, I haven't, we haven't been back to the office um, since March. We host all our daily standups and all our meetings inside the platform. That's actually made um, the platform a lot better to use. So really, um, what we're going to talk about next is the uptake in Engage this year. So Engage has grown quite significantly over the past nine months with rapid adoption happening after Q1 of 2020. And this trend is continuing and in many areas accelerating further as we progress towards 2021 with significant deals and partnerships coming on stream for next year. So some highlights for 2020, the total value of Engage deals signed this year, including platform revenue is 1.8 million in total. 
engaged user numbers have grown 600% in 12 months, up from 5,000 users to 35,000 users this year. And we're actually seeing an acceleration in user numbers um, towards, again, the second half of this year. Expected engaged revenue growth for 2020 is up 500%, up from 100,000 in 2019. Again, a large proportion of that is because Engage now is available on standalone VR devices. You don't need a PC um, to experience Engage. 65% of all Engage revenue generated is recurring revenue. So we have a subscription model on the platform where people would sign up for accounts. And we've signed over 50 commercial deals as of October 31st um, of this year, which is up from three deals in uh, 2019. So you can actually see there's a massive amount of growth within the platform and this is all on the back of uh, two business developers so really as we look forward to 2021 and 2022 we're really looking what will we do with 10 business developers what will we do with 20 and also with our, our partners HTC which I'll get, get to now in a moment so how are we generating revenue through the platform and what's our routes to market so engage has a few different sectors that we can service so we do service education and learning where people can provide distance learning or um, schools and educational institutes might have a bank of VR headsets where they will log in and they'll provide learning experiences through our platform. Engage has also been, using, been used for training and development. So we're seeing quite a lot of medical training applications being used within the platform. One of those um, um, top tier uh, university, Stanford University, use Engage for medical training. Um, then we have team collaboration. So we're seeing more and more accounts being signed up on Engage people wanting to use it for business meetings and uh, sticky, sticky note sessions and whiteboard sessions and daily stand-ups and Kanban boards. Engage has been used um, quite a lot for that. And we've seen a lot of traction, especially in the second half of this year in that area. And also Engage has been used for conferences and events. So we've hosted events for Yahoo in China. We've hosted events for HTC, hosted events for the XPRIZE Foundation, hosted events for Vodafone as well. So there's a lot of a lot of people, a lot of industries and enterprise clients testing out Engage by hosting like a small event in Engage. Then they're finding out about, okay, actually this can be used for a lot more and they're starting to sign up for enterprise accounts. So how are we getting these clients? So we're getting a lot of people coming directly to us from our own websites. So our website for Engage is very well optimized. My own background, actually, I used to be a web developer, so I know how to SEO a website properly. And we're getting um, direct clients from the website. We're also getting subscriptions directly from our website. We also have channel partners as well. So just in the last few weeks, we released Engage on the Oculus Store, the official Oculus Store, the Oculus Quest Store. And we've seen 14,000 people um, download the application. Or, sorry, yeah, about 14,000 people download the application within a few days on the Oculus Quest, and that Quest is actually becoming very, very popular. But we also have a gauge available on the Steam network and other, other networks, such as the Viveport um, store in China. And we also have resellers and partners. So this is where I'm gonna talk a little bit more about HTC. So not only when HTC um, became an investor in the company, they also became a reseller and partner. And we signed an agreement with HTC where they can resell engaged services inside the greater China region on a revenue share basis. And then on outside of China, they can also um, resell engaged services on a revenue share basis, but they have exclusivity in the greater China region. Now, HTC are a fantastic company to deal with. They're, they're a very big company, not as big as they used to be because they have sold off their phone, their phone business, but they're very much invested in virtual reality and augmented reality. They're all in on it. Um, they, they are really focused on enterprise on educa and education and we're working very closely with our partner at HTC. They're releasing um, new hardware um, um, in, in, the coming, in the coming year. We're working very, uh, very closely with HTC on making a very compelling uh, solution for enterprise clients and ed education clients and that's all coming on stream um, next year. And only four weeks ago we actually released Engage in China. So we have a, a Chinese version of Engage hosted on Chinese servers, which is, is a very unusual thing for a company of our size, where normally it takes a huge amount of resources. But again, working with HTC, having a partner on the ground, a trusted partner that actually works hand in hand with the Chinese government is, is, is a really good uh, feather in our cap in getting, in getting Engage applied in that area. And we also have uh, revenue coming in from support and services and then sometimes there's custom work involved on Engage where we might get a client looking to have 
custom branding or custom branding or custom locations on the platform. So these are some of the partnerships and some of the, the clients that we've signed up this year. So in training and development, Facebook are a client of ours now. They've signed up for an enterprise account, um, which we're hoping will grow more significant um, very, very shortly. Virtual College are a training provider in the UK, very well-known training provider with over 4 million uh, customers. They're using Engage as well, and they're trying it with some of their customers. SNCF are the train, um, train service provider in France. They're using it for training and development. On the education side, we have more education here because that's what we, we were focused on previously. Oxford University have been using the platform to provide um, remote lectures. Stanford University, as I said, have been using it to provide uh, medical training lectures. Um, the University of Arizona, a massive university in the US are using Engage. Uh, Victory XR actually are one of our partners where they provide content through our platform and resell it to their own customers. We, our resellers then would be Labaki, um, Mace Virtual Labs, and HTC, they would be the main resellers where they're uh, reselling our services um, at a minimum cost that we provide and then they, they add on on top of that. And then um, some of our big uh, clients who are using it for team collaboration, Fidelity, Fidelity Investments and Facebook would be the two main um, proponents. They, especially during COVID-19, they closed down a lot of their offices. So they have a lot of team members spread all over the country. And the way that they communicate with, with, with each other is using our platform. I think it's very, very telling that Facebook themselves have signed up for a commercial account with us to use it um, within their teams for events and for collaboration. Facebook have their own platform called Facebook Horizons, but that's really focused on social, uh, social interactions. They're really looking after kind of a younger crowd, whereas Engage really is focused on professionals and educators. And again, just with some of the events that we've hosted in the past, we've hosted events for the European Commission, XPRIZE Foundation, Ericsson, Vodafone, HTC, Yahoo, and we have other events that we have in the pipeline coming um, towards the end of this year and early next year. So just looking ahead um, to next year and beyond, um, we're totally focused on the growth on growth and partnerships for Engage. Um, the HTC revenue stream um, from China has, again, we've just literally deployed in China. That's going to come on stream in 2021. And um, we're also working hand in hand with HTC on the next wave of virtual devices coming out next year. Engage will also be available very, very soon on iOS and Apple products. So one of the, the core things um, that we see happening, especially when people want to host events on Engage is that Maybe the, the hosts themselves will have VR headsets and they'll be presenting, but the majority of users will just want to log in on their mobile phones and tablets. Engage has been available on Android phones um, for the past few months, and very soon it's going to be available on Apple products. Um, we released Engage on the Facebook uh, Oculus Store, and actually it was 15,000 installs in, over, in, in just uh, over 14 days. So it, we're getting a lot of new users on the platform. Um, we do expect virtual event revenue to grow quickly in uh, 2021. So even with um, COVID, um, a vaccine just around the corner, we think that virtual events are here to stay. There's a lot of businesses and a lot of companies are finding that they can actually do a hell of a lot with people working at home and over Skype where they don't need to, to get in a car, travel an hour and a half to go to work and back. I do feel that the world is going to have a new normal once this vaccine comes out. It's not going to go back to the way it was pre-COVID. Um, a lot of our smaller pay trial customers are now upgrading to full enterprise packages. And we're actually seeing that, um, especially over the, past, over the past couple of months. And we're currently working with a lot of our partners to, to sign them up to commercial deals for 2021. And we do expect that our reseller uh, partnerships will grow more and more and actually start to bear a lot of fruit for 2021. And also um, we're going, we're currently going through ISO um, certification and Fed, FedRAMP uh, qualification. So a lot of the um, potential enterprise clients that we're talking to are government agencies, especially in America, they require FedRAMP qualification where you go through a certain uh, type of security um, um, protocol where you can actually host their information. And we expect all of that to come online in the first half of 2021. So that's a brief overview of the company and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, David, you'd managed to take me by surprise there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. sorry about that. I was looking at the, at the schedule time there. It was a little bit short. I'm, I'm, 
I always find actually I'm more natural when, when I take questions. I'm not a natural uh, PowerPoint person. I kind of I get very jaded when, when I go through slide after slide after slide. I'm, I'm much I'm much better when I, I, I'm fed questions, to be honest. Well, I would have to say if that's you jaded, uh, I wouldn't like to see you in full flow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also Irish people tend to talk very quickly uh, as things stand anyway so it's all right I'm, I'm Scottish David I get it you know we talk <laughs> we talk quickly too <laughs> cool. now can I can I kick off the the Q&A by asking you you know yeah. to what extent has the pandemic actually changed the changed the market that you work in you know the virtual learning the training the events market and will will that ever ever return to normal, or is this literally is this advanced and accelerated growth and increased interest? Is 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 that here to stay? Yeah. So the adoption that um, we would have expected to be maybe two to four years has actually happened between two and four months. So in March, everybody jumped on Zoom. So um, they had a huge spike in in user numbers. And um, anybody who, who needs to use video-based communications, they're already on the platform. Um, but what we found is that a lot of these people who jumped on, onto Zoom trying to host virtual events and uh, conferences, what they were finding is that um, the events that they were hosting, the virtual events that they were hosting, they were just watching PowerPoint presentation after PowerPoint presentation. And um, the, for keynote talkers and the people who were attending the event, couldn't really communicate with each other, kind of similar to what we're doing now, whereas in a, in a fully virtual event on the Engage platform, each person has their own virtual body and they can move around within the environment. They can go up to exhibition uh, uh, centers exactly the same as would in the real world. They can have private hallway conversations. So it was a more interactive way of communicating. And really, this is what we're going after. Like Zoom is the communication tool of today and video-based communication and Teams, Microsoft Teams, but really, we want, um, when people talk about online communication, they say, oh, I'm going to Zoom you later or I'll Skype you later. In the next couple of years, we want people to say, um, let's engage later. I'm going to engage with you later. That's where we're positioning the platform. It's no longer a training and development platform. We see Engage as a next generation communications tool. And that's why we're seeing such a wide variety of use cases on the platform recently. Okay, David, I'm going to stop you there. This is your this is your elevator pitch uh, to London Southeast. Uh, let's say we were going to do an, an, you know this instead of doing it on Zoom, this yeah. conference on Zoom. Let's say we were going to do it on Engage at a very uh, at a very granular level. Do people need headsets? How exactly uh, would you know? What are the different barriers to entry to actually using Engage? No, they don't need headsets, and um, the headsets actually are quite inexpensive. So you can get the Oculus Quest is three hundred dollars. You can get it in any store. Fantastic device, really good experience. And um, but people can download Engage on their mobile phone and tablet now and experience Engage. So they can walk around um, using their their thumbs, move into different areas. They can actually view um, previous events that we've had inside because we have a, a spatial recording system where this event is live. So I'm talking to you, Donald, live, and this is a video presentation, and you're recording this, and then tomorrow you're going to make the video available to everybody. But the video is always going to be the same. It's never going to be different. What we have inside Engage is a spatial recording system where if somebody is giving a live presentation, we don't only record their audio. We actually record the positional data of their avatar inside the Engage platform. And as they move in the real world, their avatar will move in the virtual world. So it gives a sense of presence. So you can sit down from the point of view of participants and replay that over again. Or you can move to a different area. Or you can get up out of your seat and walk down the exhibition hall and experience what it was like during the event. It's not just um, watching a video. And one of the really cool things about Engage is our actual saving format. So you're saving a video right now, which is about an hour long you're looking at possibly about two gigabytes worth of video because to get it any pretty decent quality. On Engage, an hour long piece of content, even recording everybody else in the room is 80 megabytes because all we record is positional data, which is a big text file. And the, the audio is all compressed into an MP3 file. And an hour long MP3 file is only about 50 megabytes. So we have very small file formats, which is very, very easy for sharing. And not only can you can you can share those recordings, you can edit those recordings later by adding in special effects. And you'll see some of that stuff on our website where as somebody is talking about maybe um, uh, train maintenance, a train can actually pull up next to the person and they can pull that train apart. We're offering something that just can't be done on any other platform. And that's that's why I think this company is very interesting. How much might it cost us? Um, 
you know, I'm not, I'm not, not, I'm using just you using us as an example, but you yeah. know, is it, is it relatively inexpensive or you said that $300 for a headset was inexpensive. So I'm slightly worried. Oh <laughs> how yeah. Much, how much will it cost? So like on our, our, our licenses for engage users, we have a free, free version of, of um, engage where if you're hosting an event, anybody who wants to attend the event, they just download the platform login, very similar to zoom. Um, it's the event organizer who's actually paying for the event, but our events start at 10,000 euros and can go all the way up to 100,000 euros, depending on the exact requirements of the client and how much um, handholding that we might have to do in the background. Our enterprise um, user accounts start at, at 300 euros um, per user per year. So that'll give you a kind of an idea. And our deal sizes on the Engage platform they're around, like the average kind of deal size is around 10 to 15,000 uh, euros. But like some of the deals can be 50, 100,000 euros. But we're actually seeing bigger deals happening um, right now because a lot of the, the early adopters of Engage who are enterprise clients who've been using the platform over the past six months, who might have only got maybe a five or 10 grand uh, license, are now upgrading to say 40, 50,000 euro licenses. But with the HTC um, partnership, they already have um, many ties with large, large corporations. Like China Telecom, as an example, is, is a big client of HTC or has been in the past. Who's to say that HTC don't sign a deal with China Telecom and we have millions of users on the platform very, very quickly. These are the kind of areas of where we're focused. We're not focused on small clients getting two or $3,000 here and there. We're actually focused on partnering with these large corporations to roll it out in a big way. Okay, uh, here's a question for you. Um, with Facebook investing heavily in VR, how long before VR chat becomes mainstream and normal? And how is Engage positioned to take advantage of this? So Mark Zuckerberg last year before COVID-19 hit said he's going to put a billion people into VR in the next four to five years. And that was before COVID hit. Now, when COVID hit in March, it was a double-edged sword. So we've seen a huge amount of adoption of VR. Everybody wanted VR headsets because they were trapped in their house. They wanted an escape because you can put on a VR headset, you can sit on a virtual beach or you can go to the virtual moon or wherever you want to go and you feel like you're, you're getting an escape. But what happened is all the production of uh, VR headsets um, really slowed down because many of the components were actually made in China. All of that has been resolved now and we're actually seeing massive user numbers. Facebook don't release um, uh, how many headsets are the sales of how many set headsets that they sell each year. But if you try go and find an Oculus Quest in the shop today, you're going to really, really struggle. It, it's one of the hot, uh, hot selling tickets this year. And then with HTC, our partner coming out next year with a, a solely focused enterprise and education headset. And um, this is something that we're, 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 we're certainly in, in, in the frame for. And we expect to um, have some, some big announcements next year on it. Now, the audience has uh, suddenly woken up and the questions are beginning to flood in. Um, I've been asked uh, by Leo McCauley to ask you uh, to get some information on the financials. And for me, the financials would be, you know, have you broken even? When will you break even? What's your turnover like? Uh, you know, just fill us in. Give us a thumbnail sketch on your financial situation, your balance sheet. Yeah, we haven't, um, we haven't break, broken even yet um, this year. We will be releasing um, more information into the market uh, quite soon. Um, we, we have a healthy chunk of uh, money in the bank. I don't know actually how much of that information is currently shared on the markets, but we did do a, a small raise getting HTC on board back in March, which was 3 million euros. Um, majority of that is, is still there and our burn rate is, is very, very small. We were very frugal with how we spend our money and very smart with how we spend our money as well. The only outlay that we have are developer wages and we don't burn a lot e each month. Okay, uh, Sam Moreland is 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 on this uh, uh, too, and he's but he reiterates the Google and Facebook uh, uh, point that we heard earlier. Uh, they're investing heavily in VR. Uh, how can you hope to compete and stay cutting edge with a euro? What he describes as euros, one million euros of revenues and three million euros of cash. Uh, well, revenues would be more than that, but we. Well, what I would is. say is hugely telling is. Facebook have all the money in the world and they've been building Facebook Horizons for two years and yet they still come to us looking for enterprise licenses because they need to use it in their business. HTC, we're building a competing platform as well. Are you saying that you're, you're more nimble and better than they are? Um, I'm not going to say 
better, but we're doing something right anyway. And um, I think it really bears fruit with the amount of like up 500% this year with just two business developers. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a crazy number in anybody's book. Um, like if we do the same next year, who knows where we're going to go over the next two or three years. Um, we have a really strong development team of, of experts. It just takes one or two geniuses in your organization to make something that everybody will love. Like if you look at, back at um, Minecraft as an example, that was a single developer that poured his heart and soul into that product and it was sold for billions after that. We have those type of developers in our organization and the showcase experiences, which I just talked about briefly at the very beginning, they have been a key attraction to top talent to the company. We've won so many awards because of those. And um, what, what happens is we get these really quality developers contacting us going, geez, I really like that experience. What are you guys working on? We start up a conversation. I end up hiring those people then if, if I feel like they're, they're good for the company. So a very blunt question. Uh, what sort of revenues is the Engage platform capable of achieving? Well, as I think as I alluded to, if we... If we're getting, it's a, it's a subscription basis. If we get millions of users on the platform over the next three to four years, you're talking many millions of dollars in revenue. Like we're looking at making this company into a billion dollar company in the next two to four years. That's, that's what my sole aim is. Um, I want people to talk, to talk about us the same as they talk about Zoom today. That's, that's exactly where we're heading. And that's the kind of, of, of company that we're trying to build here. At what point do you take an exit from that billion dollar company though, David? Um, I'm, like, I'm very passionate about the company. I have 32% um, uh, stakeholding still with my wife. Um, I, I'd only step away if I feel I'm not bringing anything further to the table. If I feel the business can grow further with somebody else, that's when I will start questioning um, um, my involvement. But just to give a little, a little background about me, I started this business five years ago with zero money. I had to get a thousand euro loan from my sister to start this business. Um, and what happened was I had to, to get that thousand euro loan to buy some assets, to build a demo that I couldn't pay to even get the demo made, which I then put on Kickstarter, which actually got me 34 grand. And then I got some government funding, which was 50 grand. Like we started this business on zero revenue. And then we were the... I think two years ago, we were the first company, first tech company in 17 years to list on the Irish Stock Exchange. And we listed on AIM at the same time. So we're always overachieving and we always aim high. I'm a very, um, I won't say impatient person, but I always think I'm six months behind where I should be. Um, but then when we talk about our story, and I think this is the first time we share some numbers with Engage today, people are kind of surprised going, Do you know what, actually they've, they've achieved a hell of a lot. And most of those numbers that I talked about today have been achieved in the last six months. I have to say good luck to you, David. It's a fantastic story to hear. Well done. Um, um, I'm going to just jump in with one last question here. Is there an update on Pitbull performing on the Engage platform? And that comes from Alex Plant. So with the Pitbull performance, we were disappointed that that didn't go ahead um, as well. They're going to do something on 2D. Pitbull... Um, the event organizer themselves were actually going over and back with Pitbull. We had no uh, interaction with Pitbull directly. So it's between herself and uh, Pitbull, the, the event organizer and Pitbull. It, it has absolutely nothing got to do with us. We're hoping that something will happen early next year. But again, it's, it's, uh, it's, we have so many other events that are happening as well. And Facebook themselves actually hosted events uh, today. So I expect to hear some, some big news on events early next year, but we have nothing in the diary yet to say that it's happening. Okay, my last, last question to you, David. You said you'd signed 1.8 million euros of business this year. Is this, do you mean one-off business or residual subscription or contracts? Uh, it's all three. It's mostly, that's mostly uh, recurring revenue um, contracts in that 1.8 million. Okay. David, I'm very grateful to you for such a, a brief answer. Wow, you really brought that to life. Well done. For a man who, who doesn't like doing presentations, I thought that was uh, incredibly good. And your Q&A, uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks a lot, guys. Stay Thank safe. Thank you. Uh, have a good evening, David. Uh, and that's it. We hope to have a full program of at least uh, seven live webinars for you next year. So do look out for those. Uh, tomorrow, we'll send you slide packs from Power, from Cora, Zephyr, and the very wonderful David from VRE. And as well as well as a video link for the entire event. So watch out for those tomorrow and we'll send individual 
individual uh, presentations in the coming days. And uh, a final uh, brief plug for us. Don't forget to go to the London Southeast company chat boards and share the updates of all those uh, uh, extraordinary and amazing things that we've just seen over the, the past four presentations and uh, share, share some updates with those who couldn't make it tonight. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us to the end. It certainly wasn't bitter, not with David. And we're very grateful for your time. Good night and stay safe.